also thank the Dutch Embassy in Port of Spain, the National Trust, the Phillipsburg Jubilee Library, and the Tobago Library Services for sponsoring this lecture series. Today our lecture is going to be presented by Mr. Arthur Skydy. And I will now read his biography. Arthur Skydy studied fine arts at the Las Vegas Academy for International Studies, Performing and Visual Arts. He has a diploma from the Design, Design Academy in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, and became a concept designer of amusement park attractions at ShowQuest Studios in Vekoma. Since 2002, he has been a freelance designer, writer, and artist in both the arts and applied arts. His projects vary from design, visualization, sculpture, historical research and writing, and includes a comic book, artistry, animation, film, and fine art. Arthur's direct ancestor, Adrian Skydy, was rescued from the 18th century VOC ship Woostdown, which perished just off the coast of the Netherlands. This rescue of his ancestor is the reason his family, the Skydy family name is still alive. His research eventually ignited the creation of multiple scientific and historical books and articles about several maritime subjects. Together with the Dutch Royal Navy and the country's cultural institutions, Arthur searched for the shipwreck of the 17th century Zealand flagship from the time when the seven provinces was Holland's flagship. This flagship perished close to the city of Flushing and archival documents show that there are still multiple bronze cannons in the seabed. He later identified the wreck of the VOC ship Dermamer that was wrecked off the coast of Banana Island near Sierra Leone for a team of American, Polish, and English divers. The history of what occurred, including a map of the ship's last plotted positions before arriving in Cape Town, and the identity of the sole survivor is recorded. At a shipwreck conference in Plymouth, England, renowned shipwreck explorer Rex Cohen thought that the unearthed wreck and the research was a great story. Rather recently, he rediscovered the location of the family crypt of Jan VI, who was painted by and a friend and patron of the renowned painter Rembrandt. Apart from scientific works, he also creates more accessible comic books, graphic and novel editions of historical subjects. In 2019, Sky Day, together with the former military intelligence officer and former Royal Navy commander, created a graphic novel about the Battle of Skelt and the liberation of the Dutch in 1944's toughest battle in Europe after Normandy, which later became a bestseller. He is involved in design, visualization, writing, animation, and sculpture, which form the pillars of his work. He also dabbles in co-creating cinematic features. Arthur Skyden. Thank you very much. Um, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, a few things uh, that were just mentioned uh, you will see in the video that I pre-recorded. I wanted to respond one moment to the to the message uh, Professor Bacharov indicated. Indeed, uh, these are the the Huis de Kreiningen and Michiel de Ruiter, and he's the person uh, why I got uh, interested in the ship and why I contacted Professor Bacharov seven years ago. 
and the rest uh, you'll see as the video uh, is started. Thank you. Okay, everyone, just be reminded to keep your um, mics on mute as we proceed. I'm going to start the video now. Thank you. I'm Arthur Scheide. Um, for Americans, it's easier to say Arthur Scheide, so you don't have to pronounce the guttural sound of Scheide. Um, so about seven years ago, I contacted Professor Krum Bacharov because he and his team uh, found a wreck in the Bay of Tobago. That wreck is the Huis de Kruiningen, right here. Coordination is a bit off because I re reversed the video. The warship might just be the only tangible piece of ship that still in, uh, exists that Michiel de Ruiter sailed on. That's this guy. Michiel de Ruiter is the single most famous individual in Dutch maritime history. He is to my country what George Washington is to yours. Uh, I've written a book about him. This book. And uh, Krum, uh, sorry, Professor Bacharov, this book I'll be sending to you. Uh, it's about the, the first career of the man. Most people know only about his second career. I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, I'll tell you first a little bit about myself, who I am. Uh, then about Michiel de Ruiter. Then about the Huis de Kruiningen, of which I found a few cool details about Rumer Vlak, the commander at the time in 1677 when it went down. And at the end, I'll show you a few objects uh, that I made myself or I'm in process of making that are somehow related and cool to show. I hope you enjoy it. So first a little bit about myself. Um, I am officially a designer I'm into filmmaking, illustration, drawing, animation, all sorts of things. Uh, doing research is sort of my passion. I got into researching because of my own ancestry. Uh, my ancestor, seven generations back, Adrian Scheide, came back from the East Indies as one of four brothers who actually survived the East Indies and shipwrecked right in front of the Dutch coast. He was rescued. I looked up everything that had to do with that. I wrote a book and that got me into writing more books and doing more research about other subjects. And um, I'm, I'm sort of known by two nicknames. One is a lawnmower because when I look at a source, I look at everything I have in front of me, not just the few things that I'm looking for. I know, also know that in that source, other things are not to be found. And the other nickname is the Dutch detective. The Dutch Detective has to do with the second project that I'll show you. Um, there are two projects, the Walger and the Diemermeer, that sort of uh, have to do with the kind of stuff you're doing in the Bay of Tobago. This is the flagship of Zeeland. This is a drawing I made based on a drawing of Willem van der Velde, a 17th century artist. Uh, that drawing you can find at the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art under the name Camp Vere, Camp Vere. It's not the Camp Vere, it's the Walger, it's the flagship. Uh, I can deduce that from drawings and paintings uh, by other people. I've tried to inform the Met, but they're not responding. Based on this drawing, I made a color drawing that we actually lose, used for publicity with uh, the Royal Navy when we were looking a couple of years back. Uh, the colors are based on a, a painting of the actual ship. 
so there's an approximation of what it actually was. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to this at the end. This is uh, the coast of Flushing. You see a windmill and a buoy. And this is the military explosive uh, services ship of the Royal Navy. They were diving. We were not allowed to dive. They were diving. Uh, as practice, they uh, helped us uh, look for the wreck. We got to 95% of actually finding it, detecting it. And then they had to, uh, they were needed elsewhere. And hey, uh, military stuff always goes in front of any uh, archaeological stuff. So we don't have a team that can actually look at the ship or the wreck uh, long. We're at the grace of the Royal Navy. And I don't think it's going to happen again. But the ship wrecked around that buoy, trying to get into the harbor, which was at the right side. The entrance of the harbor was on the right side of the windmill. And we looked with a Remus system. You're probably familiar with that. The remote environmental monitoring system, like a torpedo to me, that draws the, the, the lanes of the, the sonar scans that we have to view. At first, they didn't want us to look, but uh, at a certain point, they figured that oh, you see a lot more than we do <laughs> because we were looking for different things. They look for explosives. We look for archaeological stuff. Those are a couple of cool days, very cool days. And this is one thing we found, which we think, because of this cut here, may be of a ship. Now, Arend Voss, who was part of this uh, endeavor, who has been critical of the Huis de Kruiningen because of the forks, has been critical of this um, being part of a ship, but we keep the option open that it may be. The second project is the Diemermeer. For English and American divers, I uh, helped them figure out which ship they found, which wreck they found. This is the uh, coast of Africa, Banana Island near Sierra Leone. And they found a VOC shipwreck, Dutch East India Company. The anchor that they found, and they found a few cannon that had the logo on it. And I managed to identify the ship, the Diemermeer who got there, uh, shipwrecked, people on board were sick, they went to shore, people from shore got onto the ship, tried to wreck it, and I actually identified the single survivor who came to uh, pick up his pay in the Netherlands. And the divers of this project uh, gave me the nickname the Dutch detective, and I think the American ones, based among others on this project, got into the Explorers Club, which I think is kind of cool. This is a ship from about a century later. This is comparable. So I think it's the Mercur yeah, Mercurius, which is sort of the same time of the Dimamir. The most cool thing I found with that project was a manuscript uh, map. It was in Australia, Library of Australia. And this is uh, Dutch East India, the south of Africa on the left. And the blue is the whole uh, voyage back to it and back. I think the big one is to it via India and back is the short route with the daily locations of this ship. They left it in Cape Town. That's why this one still exists. So that gives you an impression. I know a little bit about ships, about research, about what you guys are doing. To give a, a short impression as to why the router is important to more countries than just my own, is as a, as a boy he fought against the Spanish. Later as a captain he fought against the Portuguese who were fighting the Spanish. Then he, he as a tradesman he sailed with the English, but when war broke out with England he fought against those same captains. He fought against the English. The plan was to fight together with the French against the English, but the French at first did not show up. Um, he fought for the Danish against the Swedish. And just about anybody who knows anything about maritime history in Denmark knows who the Michiel de Ruiter is. Um, 
the writer was awarded uh, a crest by the Danish king. He was made a knight by the French king. The English king tried to make him a knight as well, but the writer refused. And at the end of his life, he fought for the Spanish against the French, which became fatal. Uh, he died of his wounds. But the Spanish king made him a duke, which is sort of the highest military function. Uh, that would have caused problems because he would have had a higher rank than the Dutch prince. Uh, so it's not that bad. Maybe he had to refuse it if he had still lived and received it, actually received it. But it gives you an impression of this man is not just important in my country. He has been there for various other countries at various times later on. As a boy, 11 year old boy, he went to sea for the first time. He went to um, the Amazon, to a colony. And when he came back, uh, there's not a lot known from the 17th century um, biography that is uh, known. The biography is the reason why he is so well known. His whole life has been described. Well, almost all of his life, I found a lot of new stuff. And I'd like to show you a few things based on these images. This is a page I, um, uh, from 1620 to 22. I looked at all the payrolls with all the crews that are still available in Zeeland. And I found this page of this ship, the Zeepart, uh, the, the seahorse, literally the seahorse. And I found here Michiel Adriaanse van Vlissingen. Uh, uh, one detail that's interesting, everybody talks about Michiel de Ruiter, Michael de Horseman, but he himself hardly ever wrote de, the, in his name. That's also what it says here, Michiel Arians. Arians was his father. Um, this is his pay as someone who climbs into the, the, the band, uh, I don't know the English word, the, the, the lines that go from the, the, the side of the ship to the mast. And uh, serving on this ship from 1622 to 26, he was part of the crew, climbed in function, got higher pay, which are details that uh, concur with or uh, fit with what was written in the biography. And this ship actually was sent to Bergen of Zoom, where he is known to have fought against the Spanish. So this is sort of a cool detail. Hey, nothing is 100%, but it is very likely that this is him as a teenager. Now, this is the first painting that is known in Zeeland. In Ze uh, Zeeland. Uh, there are two versions of this. The original is in the Maritime Museum in Zeeland. The other is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And this is sort of uh, what he looked like uh, as, a, as a tradesman. This is the tradesman. <coughs> he worked for the brothers Lumpsins, Cornelis and Adrian Lumpsins. That is interesting because the island of Tobago was under patronage of these two gentlemen. Uh, only one of the brothers has a painting that we know of. This is Cornelis, who lived in Flushing, the same place the Ruiter was. Uh, this man uh, was mayor of the city at a certain point, and he also was the, the, the best man to Michiel de Ruiter's wedding, his third wedding, I think. His first two wives passed away. On the right, you see the combined uh, crest, of which the left part is of uh, Cornelis Lampsens. He was the patron of Tobago in the 17th century. No longer when the Huis de Kruine went down there, but he and his brother were, I think, Tobago, St. Eustatius, I don't know what the English word is, and St. Martin at some point. <coughs> This is the, the, the merchant ship that the Ruiter sailed on, uh, called Salamander. There is a model of this ship based on the information that is known about it. About a hundred people served on this ship. 
and he uh, had a trade route over the Netherlands, Morocco, and the Caribbean. <clears throat> he went to Morocco to bring salt and sugar and weapons. He got uh, things like gold and silver from the trade routes of the Sahara and hides and uh, stacked the, the process of getting them in the ship was almost a month. You can see that in his uh, journals. <clears throat> I photographed all of his journals throughout his careers, both his careers. I have all those pictures here on the computer. When he was done in Morocco, he sailed to the Caribbean and there he sold the stuff that he bought in Morocco. In the Caribbean, he traded with the French and with the English on the various islands. He's probably been to Tobago. I need to look that up if that's actually true. Uh, certainly uh, St. Christopher and Martinique and Barbados. <coughs> and uh, when he was done there, he sailed back to the Netherlands and then it went uh, the, the, circle, the same circle again. He did that for his whole first career, you could say, <clears throat> as a tradesman. Then he wanted to retire, stay at home, stay on shore. It was his third wife, the first who passed away. He had children. He didn't want to do much more, just enjoy life. That's when war broke out with England. <clears throat> and he was asked to... Sorry, I gotta get a glass of water because this isn't working. One moment, please. Okay, I'm back again. I'm better. <clears throat> uh, so this is his ship based on a model, which was made way after his time. This is not a photo of an original or a drawing after a photo of an original. Uh, but it shows you the type of ship he had in his first uh, career as a tradesman. Now, he was uh, quite a bold individual. At one time in Morocco, he had his uh, ship laden full of cargo and he tried to sail back to the Netherlands. But at the north end of Morocco, near Salé, um, he encountered three Barbary Admiralty ships, the Admiral, the Vice Admiral and another indiv individual of the Barbary fleet, which was an enemy Barbary fleet. He figured, if I stay here, they're going to conquer me. If I try to flee, they're faster, they're bigger, they're going to conquer me. So they had a, a, a Krijgsraad, uh, not the exact word, uh, how do you call it, a meeting of war on his ship, his trade ship. They uh, waited at the night and in the morning they, decide, they decided to do a bold thing. They loaded all the cannons, sailed straight through to the, uh, to the shore, to the Algiers shore, and opened fire the whole broadside onto the Admiralty ship, all three of them, at the same time. That's quite a bold move, and it worked, because his ship was probably heavily damaged, but he made it to shore. And that's because of this image, made by Herman Padbrugge. And you see here the Ruiter on shore on a horse, because he's a horseman, the Ruiter. And in the back, at sea, you see uh, ships burning, which are the Admiralty ships that he just sort of wrecked all on his own. Now, personally, I think this is the moment where people from the Dutch Admiralties uh, saw that's the kind of guy we need when war breaks out. The Danish king, Frederick III, gave him the status of nobility. <clears throat> he was awarded this crest uh, as if he were already nobility. Now, the horseman probably has to do with him uh, being called the writer. The left is the Dannebrog, the oldest flag in Europe. And it's sort of a rebus. For Denmark, the writer uh, fought at sea and at land. And on land. Now, little detail, you see three cannonballs, two at the top and one at the bottom. There are a lot of people, descendants, who keep saying, oh, whenever it's displayed, it needs to be two at the top and one at the bottom. 
that's actually not really true because if you look at the crest that he had in his ring and in his stamp which he uh, stamped uh, postage with he actually had one made with two at the bottom one at the front, at the top so he, he he was a logical man and this is one of the medallions with the face of the danish king uh, with all diamonds around it that he got this is uh, displayed on the painting that the writer of the writer and it's actually mentioned in his papers when he passed away so this was quite an honor <clears throat> this is a, a sort of a personal favorite of mine uh, the, the the Ferdinand Boll was a, a, a how do you call it a student of Rembrandt and he painted Michiel de Ruiter this is sort of the most famous picture of the writer anywhere this is one there are many original paintings there are at least six maybe seven let me see one two three four five six seven at least eight original paintings now this is a cool thing this is a sketch that was made before the painting only this sketch no longer exists this was digitized at some point or it made a photo of at some point but the original drawing is gone and I've researched these paintings uh, they're sort of sort of similar they all have this this cloth behind it with the tassels and the, the seven provinces in the, in the back with a globe and him standing here sort of the same but I identified the differences the similarities and the differences the similarities here are the way he holds the the, the admiral's staff there's the same but the difference are the tassels here there are two one in front one in the back smaller and this one is in the front too so both in the front and here it's only in the back only one <clears throat> they're different sizes they're different these are all in different museums this is the same one again same way he holds the staff and again unique tassels because this is different than that <clears throat> this one is actually in his hometown with the the what do you call it harness and here are a couple more this is sort of research I do okay I got to show you this uh, uh, letter this image <clears throat> when he helped the Danish against the, the Swedish fight against the Swedish he had the idea of sending his military his, his soldiers from the ship to land that was sort of the start of the Marines in 1663 the English already had a uh, regiment on foot soldiers foot soldiers on board of ships but they did not call them Marines yet in 1664 the plan was made to create the Marine Corps and in 65 that happened now there are respected Dutch historians who say ah, there's no inf evidence there is no correspondence between the two so uh, the writer had nothing to do with it I tend to disagree because it's not necessary to find uh, the information itself as long as you know where the person who founded the Marine Corps got the information <clears throat> um, Johan de Witt was the Raadspensionaris sort of the president of Holland and he founded in the states of Holland the Marine Corps in December 1665 this is the thing you see at the bottom at the top is a letter from him uh, on board the ship the seven provinces aboard the writer ship there's also you see it in the middle the head ship the seven provincia there's also another letter where uh, Johan de Witt thanks the writer for all his advices at the time that he was on board of his ship so that is indirect information that just before uh, the, uh, Johan de Witt founded the Marine Corps he got all the information the expertise of the writer to do so so my conclusion is Michiel de Ruiter caused the Marine Corps to be founded
the Order of St. Michael. The French uh, Knight's Order, one of the highest Knight's Orders in Europe, was awarded to Michiel de Ruiter. Also to uh, Cornelis Lampsins, who was the patron of Tobago. It's this chain, which he's also displayed on uh, the main paintings of de Ruiter. And here you see uh, St. Michael fighting a little devil. I'll get back to this image in a little bit because of what it says at the bottom. Just before he uh, had his fatal battle, he managed to free 28 religious Hungarian people from slave ships. And Hungary has been thankful to Michiel de Ruiter ever since. Every year people uh, come together at the grave of de Ruiter, the crypt. There's an ornate crypt in the main church in Amsterdam on Dam Square. And the, <coughs> the, the ambassador of Hungary is usually there. What I did, this is a drawing of that time where these slaves, these Hungarian slaves, got onto the ship of the Ruiter. You can find that in the, in the journals. The Ruiter gave them a passport so they could journey back to their own uh, country. But on the left, I think it's quite cool, are the actual uh, signatures of those Hungarian slaves. I looked at all kinds of uh, album uh, amicorums like a book friends, friends books, where they uh, one writes in the book of another and a lot of these sign their names. Aside from the few that passed away, I have all the names of all those slaves that the writer saved, rescued. I'm going to go back to that image I said uh, I'd go back to, this one. So he rescued the Hungarian slaves. Uh, after that, he fought a battle against the French for the Spanish and got wounded. And a week later, he passed away. His intestines were buried on a, a sand hill at the coast, but the rest of his body was put in a, a, a coffin and sailed back on his ship to the Netherlands. Now, the enemy king, the French sun king, Louis XIV, who awarded him this high honor of uh, the Knight of St. Michael, ordered all the port cities in France to fire salute cannons whenever they saw his ship sail by. Now, that's quite something, that the, that the enemy king orders this about the person he was fighting. And after he uh, came back, his body came back, he was, let me go to the correct image. He uh, got a state funeral, that's one of the impress most impressive ones in, in Dutch history. This is a drawing that I, there's an original drawing that I put color into that's in the book. It was a big parade with all kinds of people getting into that uh, damn square church where the crypt is. And He's been there ever since. Now we get to the ship itself, the Huis de Kruiningen, the House of Kruiningen. These are two images that I used and published in my book about the router when I listed all the ships that he's been sailing on. This, the one ship that may still be there or probably still is there. Um, it, it came from an unclear Willem van der Velde drawing. I have a request out for a better copy of that drawing so I can be more precise about what it actually looks like. But what we see on this taffrail is, or taffrail, I don't know what, what you prefer. This is a castle. That is the castle Kruiningen in Kruiningen itself. I'll 
show a little later where Kreininger is exactly. Uh, but you, you, you can take it that every ship, every Dutch uh, ship that's called Huis te something is a house on the back of the ship named after a building. I once made a design for a billboard in Delft uh, for Ruiven, it's, uh, close to Delft, uh, because they thought that uh, the house that was there, that the castle, was named after the ship. And after I made the design, I told them, no, the ship is named after the castle. Uh, the house, house of Suite, House of Swedes, and the House of Kreiningen. I don't know how you say it, House of Kreiningen or something. Uh, they're both named after castles. Uh, Zwieten is a, a castle in Holland, and Kreiningen was a castle in Zeeland, so in the south. Um, if you look here, you see in the middle, this probably is the crest of the city of Amsterdam. At the top, this looks like one of those uh, fish, big whale-like fish. Here you have Batavians, two Batavians. Um, and over here, this could be decoration, could be, I, I don't really recognize a lion. Maybe there's a figure there, but it's a little unclear. It's got five windows. Uh, and two portholes at the bottom with uh, something painted uh, in the under the uh, under the wilft. I don't know what the English word is. Now, th here this is also from a drawing which is the Huis de Kreiningen from uh, England, the Greenwich Maritime Museum, and I applied some sails to it that uh, go with such ships. It's probably not going to be exact exactly how it was, but it's similar. Three. Uh, square uh, sailed masts. Okay, now this is another drawing I made uh, according to an etch from the Rijksmuseum. This is the battle in the Bay of Tobago. You have the French Glorieux with the with the fleur de lis in the in the flag, and next to it I think is the the Huis de Kreiningen with the Dutch flag. This is the moment that you've been examining only after it. On the bottom of the water, water of the what is it? The bay. Now, this I thought was cool. This is not that moment in 1677. This is the Battle of Sol Bay, but it's sort of similar. This is it shows in a spectacular way what it must have been like. This is an English ship, and also a Dutch burner ship that uh, yeah makes the big ship burn, which is kind of uh, yeah, cool. You have the 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 man, the 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 men, the the crew, getting overboard here, and that must have been similar to what happened in the Bay of Tobago. Um, I have some things written down. The ship was built. I thought it was built by uh, Samuel Sautain, but I understand that he was a merchant and he had the ships built for Genoa. Um, the man lived from 1593 to 1672. Uh, he had a monopoly on marble from Italy in the Netherlands. So a lot of buildings that have a lot of marble that come from him. Uh, in 1644 he was named Ontvanger Generaal, the main, main accountant who received the funds to buy a new uh, uh, to buy and build new warships. So he had to do with building ships. Uh, he was not trusted by the government of Holland because he had ties with the Portuguese king. And there have been some shady dealings with uh, grain. Things like not being allowed to, tr to, to transport them, but they did in any way under different flags. Things like that. So he wasn't really trusted, but hey, he had, he had good ties, he had good connections, and that took precedent. The man, uh, uh, when he was 64, became a consul uh, of Genoa in Italy. And that's also the place where he, in 1661, uh, apparently was murdered by a Dutchman. Now, I told you he lived from 93 to 72. Most people, or most uh, sources will indicate that. But it looks like he was murdered in 61. And that the person who died in 72 with his son of the same name, who continues his trade. 
And this is the crest of the man who had the ships built. Uh, this comes from the album Amicorum, that's like a, a book for friends. Uh, that they could write something, have a nice drawing made into it. And this is from the, the, the Royal uh, Library in The Hague. Now here we have some cool details. This is a lot of text with a lot of red, a lot of blue. I tried to make it easy and I'll just uh, go through it. I'll make sure that this information makes it way over there so you can study it a little more. I'll, I'll see what I can translate for you. Uh, this is from a book, the Vlootbouw, the, the building the fleet in the Netherlands in the first half of the 17th century by Elias. And the blue is the highlights of where it is talking about the, the ships. Uh, here it indicates that Samuel Soutijn in Amsterdam uh, had the ships built for the Republic of Genoa in Italy. Um, first, they wanted only the Huis de Suite because it was a larger ship, but because there was an order of 30 ships for the new war with England, they also bought the Huis de Kruiningen. That had a, a length of 140 feet. There were several other ships that were already built at that length, but they bought it anyway, so they had 30 ships. Now, this is interesting. This is the resolution of the States General of 14 and 19 February and 26th of March in 1653. That is the order to buy both ships, the Huis de Suite and the Huis de Kruiningen. Now, I can't access uh, those resolutions at this time. We are in full lockdown, uh, but later on I can see if, if it can be obtained or perhaps you could obtain it directly. That's also possible. Um, Let's continue. Here we have the, yeah, the buying of the Huis de Kruinen to make uh, 30 in total. Both ships are bought. And there's another resolution of 20 and 23rd of May 1653, uh, where they indicate that the, the envoy of uh, Genoa, that must be Sautain, and the States General, so that's the, the government of the entire country, not just one province, uh, made a deal for 140,000 guilders for both ships. But Sautain said, no, I need 170 total. So later on in August, the next year, he got another 30,000. Now, since the one ship, the Suite, is bigger, was bigger, and the Kreininger was smaller, I'd figure the one cost 100,000 and the other 70,000. Um, initially, the ship, the suite was intended for uh, Florison, what was his name? Peter Florison, but it was uh, given to Witte de Witt. Now that was a guy that was not appreciated by any crew or people. That was an, an unpleasant individual. But he got the house to suite. And um, when he <coughs> and the Ruiter, Michiel de Ruiter, who I talked about previously, uh, we're ready to for the Battle of Scheveningen in 10 August 1653. These two ships were ready to go to sea, but not ready to go into battle. So they could not use them yet. And that battle is uh, the one where Maarten Tromp, the predecessor of the Ruiter, the respected predecessor of the Ruiter, died. This is the moment where the Ruiter took over in, in uh, yeah, respect of the people leadership. He didn't get appointed until much later, but it is an important moment. Um, after this battle, the Ruiter and the Wit went to, uh, I think, Norway. And when they came back on, uh, on the suite and the Huis de Kruiningen, when they came back, they were in a heavy storm uh, in front of Tessel in November 53. And... Um, what they concluded was that the ships were built too slender uh, to really work and that uh, a bulk, a belly, needed to be created. Now it indicates here that a belly of 16 thumbs, and I think that sort of inch size, thumbs, a big belly, was attached to the bottom, made a little broader, so that when the ship slanted, the middle ports of the lower row, uh, would not catch any water 
so that they could be used to shot cannons from cannon fire i know cannon and cannons is different it's officially it's cannon but i say cannons anyway now let's go here oh yeah and then in the end um after they were uh, changed improved is the moment where the router went from the Huis de Kruiningen to the Huis de Suite. So the router has not been on this ship very long, but he has been on the ship. And you guys found a remains of a ship that he was on, which is cool. Um, this, is, this is interesting. This is from the journal of the router. Uh, I have all them photographed. And first I would like you to just appreciate how difficult it is to read his writing at all. It's got a lot of shapes and sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to see what is he writing here. But I highlighted it in the ship Huis de Kruiningen from Amsterdam. So this was his journey to Norway and back. It's not a lot of pages. I can provide those pages too, but translating those is a little more difficult. Um, when uh, they, the ships were bought, both of those ships were bought from Samuel Sautain. They were bought by the fami family uh, Bicker van Zwieten. So that's when they got the names Zwieten, Zwieten and Kruiningen. And this is... Uh, uh, yeah, sort of a statue, the giant of Bicker Island. So this is a remnant of the island that the Bicker family owned. The Bickers were very influential in Amsterdam. It was four brothers who were in sort of everything that has to do with trading, with ships, with companies, with uh, everything. They, they, they were powerful people. Let me take a look. Otte Blom. Are we there yet? No, not yet. I'll show an image of the Huis de Suite first. This is one I also published in my book. And this is based on a painting that's in the Maritime Museum in England, in Greenwich. And this was also not so clear. There's a better drawing of this from uh, Van der Velde. But you see again two uh, Batavians on the sides, um, some decoration at the top, and the castle Zwieten in the middle. Now we get to Otto Blom. Otto Blom was a man in the Netherlands who is no longer among us. He passed away uh, several years ago, but he created a fantastic manuscript to build the famous ship Seven Provinces of the Ruiter. Uh, he drew uh, detailed uh, building drawings and he also had a huge uh, model that he was making himself. Uh, nobody's really supposed to have access to that manuscript, but there are ways. The interesting is, oh, here you see one of those drawings that you've used as well, I think, in your report. And here you can, in, you can see how detailed he was with uh, drawing everything with the, the, the angles and the sizes and what goes where and is attached to what. This is very, very detailed work. If you ever get a chance to look at that, I, I, I recommend it. The interesting thing is that in this document, this manuscript, it indicates the price of ships, which is cool. We know 100,000, 70,000 for Huis de Suite Huis de Kruiningen. And here it talks about a decision from the States of Holland, so the government of Holland, 1652. A ship of 134 feet, which is a little shorter than the Huis de Kruiningen, 56,000 guilders. Uh, it divides up into the hull being uh, 19,000 iron, 6,000 anchors, 2.5, round wood, uh, and mast parts, 2,500. Here we have anchor cables and uh, lines, almost 6. Here we have the sails at the bottom, also six. Now, um, in the total price of a ship in that time, about half went into the hull, the decorations on the tefferal, and the ironwork. 
about a third went into the lines, the round woods and the sails, about a fifth into the uh, anchors, the cables and all the inventory. Added to that is another half, uh, sort of, if this is 100%, another 50% went into cannons. So to arm a ship, it costs you 150% of the, the, the buying the ship itself. And on this page, it names both the Huis de Kruiningen and the Huis de Suite. It also indicates the May 1653 resolution. So that's why I wanted to share this with you. They are named in this very document. Let me see. Okay, Kruiningen. I have some information about that. Let me see. The Kruiningen Castle. This is Europe. The red is my country in between England, Germany, Denmark and Belgium. And we also have a border that we share with France. Not here, but on the island of St. Martin. If we zoom in, this is the Netherlands with Germany to the side, Belgium to the bottom. And the red area is the province of Zeeland. We go to the next one. This is the province of Zeeland. And the lower island used to be an island, now it's a peninsula. Uh, the red area is Kruiningen, which is close to Eerseke. And I drive through that on, on the highway very, very often. I used to, two years ago before COVID and everything. And that's, that's where Kruiningen is, where the ship was named after. There was a castle there. This is a, a, a drawing of the village, Kruiningen, the church and the huge castle that used to be there. That image or one that is similar to this was displayed on the tafferel of the ship. Now let me see if I have some details here about... Oh right, what does Kruiningen mean? Apparently the, uh, it's a place where a kruin it is the characteristics of the landscape. And the kruin is an elevated area in a landscape. So uh, the, 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 the kruiningen is something that is higher in a landscape. Whether that's a hill or larger or smaller is not really clear, but it has to do with an elevation. It's cool to know if you know the name of the ship. Now here's a, a close up of that ship little better if one of those the early carriages also I think it's uh, the ship was very similar I think this might just be the drawing that they used on the back of the ship looks the same now here is a old drawing you know this one also of what the ship was built back in those days they did not build ship with drawings a lot of drawings were made after the ships were built, but they did not use drawings to build them. They used models. And I want to show you one cool model. This is of the Huis Tijdverdrijf, uh, of which a, a cool later drawing also exists. But this is an original model. So these are the sort of models they used when they were building new ships. Then where they would say, well, this needs to be a little fatter. This needs to be a little more slender, higher, lower. And it's cool to see the original colors of what they painted it and this is also a house too so it's also known uh, uh, named after a house a building and here you see one of those batavians with the roman like skirts i know they have but they a special name and here we see little characters maybe this one is from similar similar year This is a cool painting. This is in the uh, National Gallery of Art in, I believe, Washington. Yeah, Washington. This is a painting by Reinier Noms called Zeeman. And this is uh, ships uh, laying near Amsterdam. And they are uh, near that bigger island. Because this moment is after the family Bicker van Swieten bought the two ships from uh, Samuel Sautijn. The ship on the right, 
of which you see the tefrel, is the house de suite. So that, that's the larger of the two. Still, it's cool to, to see uh, such a detailed uh, ship of, of the rear. We see the in the middle the, the crest of the Amsterdam with the three crosses. We see the, the crest or, or the symbol of the Admiralty. The castle Zwitte here. There are two uh, boards, two shields hanging there. Those are usually uh, uh, loose. Sometimes you see models of the uh, Zeven Provincie, which has seven uh, of those boards, and one of them is, is slanted, and they fixed it. And that's not what you're supposed to. It's the, the ship slanted, that's why the board slanted also, so they could replace those. On the side are those Batavire, with uh, what could be, I don't know, if you look at this, this could be a mermaid. I don't know, could be just regular decoration. At the top we see like a, a shell with two fishes, those those whale-like fishes, and an old man. Now that's not really Neptune, but uh, it's thought to be a, a, a famous individual in Italy who was portrayed as Neptune. So that's a clear Italian feature of this ship. And the Huis de Kruining was rather similar to this one. I really like this painting. It's beautiful. Rumor Vlak. Uh, Professor Bacharov indicated that of the people that were involved in the Battle of, Salt, of uh, Tobago, the Rumor Vlak was a rather unknown individual. Uh, we know that he took his ship, the Kruiningen, got into a fight with the French, um, which became troublesome, put the fire into the powder chamber, uh, the ship exploded, he survived, and 56 people did not. Um, you all know this quite well. When we look at Rumor Vlak, there is a bit of a biography. Let me reduce this. And this is in Dutch, but I'm going to uh, read it in English because I translated it. Um, in 1678, he's back in the Fatherland. On a different ship, he escorted several trade ships to Biscay in France. Six years later, Prince William III made him an extra extraordinary captain. I don't know whether that's a function in English, but it's an extraordinary captain, a captain in Amsterdam. In 1693, he made a couple of journeys. In 1703, this is the year that he passed, he protected the trade fleet. He captured the ship Muiderberg to Portugal. On the way back, five ships accompanied him, five warships. They got into a battle with an equal amount of French warships that were better equipped and manned with more people. Right at the beginning of the fight, he had an arm and part of his shoulder shot off, but he kept on fighting. The main mast of his ship slammed down on the deck as his ship was close to shot to pieces. The royal emissary, Count van Waldstein, and his entourage were on board of Vlak's ship. Uh, this ship was the Muiderberg. They begged him to lower the flag, yet he, they got the answer from Vlak. I have too great an honor to surrender as long as I am able to withstand the enemy. Sort of a repeat of 1677. The Muiderberg was in a disastrous state. 42 bodies lay all over the ship and even a greater amount is either wounded or dying. Not until he saw that there was no more way to defend himself because of his ripped off arm, he could not blow up the ship, he lowered the red blood flag. For hours he had to remain on board. The water threatened to seep into all the holes of the wretched ship and swallow them whole. But before he was able to go down below deck, uh, one of the French sloops came to pick him up. He was uh, brought to Toulon in the south of France and after five weeks of agony he died on the 17th of July 1703 due to his wounds. Uh, it was known that he preferred a hero's death over being taken prisoner. 
His crest is in the church of Gouda, and the wooden board, board below it states, Vlak, the fright of France, de-armed, who died in Toulon, which obtained his ashes. A hero who never gave up until he conquered all. Now, that uh, board, I happen to have already a photo of, and that is this. Uh, Gouda is uh, Gouda. You probably know Gouda cheese. One moment. <laughs> Gouda cheese is Gouda. Gouda kaas. And the text that I just uh, gave you is written right here at the bottom. Vlak, the fright of France. Frankens is an old word for French. This is all very old English text. This is the original board that's on the wall of the, of the church in Gouda with number 27. And in the old days, back then, there was also his coat of arms above it, which is gone now. Um, probably has to do with Napoleon trying to get rid of all that. Um, what you see there is the wax seal of his grandson. And I have an explanation of what his crest um, is. <laughs> Oh yeah, if we look close, you have the coat of arms, and this is the shield, the crest. It's a tree in the middle, with two spotted horses jumping up against it. And the spotted is important, because a spot is a vlak, or, or a vlek, a vlek in Dutch. And I think, I don't know, but I think that vlak, the last name of rumor vlak, has to do with flag of spotted horse. And here you see three things, two to the side and one in the, the top of the, the tree, and they are kaarden. Now, I don't know what that is. They could be combs for, for uh, cutting hair, but kaarden is not very clear. Okay, next image. Uh, the battle that I explained has been uh, drawn. This is an image from the Rijksmuseum um, by P.J. Schotel. The battle between several Dutch and French warships in May 1703. So this is the, the battle that was the end, or finally became the end of Rumor Vlak. Now I have two more cool things to show you. One. This is a torpedo boat from the First World War that was named Rumor Vlak. The top two images are of a model in a, in a case, and below is a photo of the ship in action. It has the, the, the signature G5. So he has not been forgotten. And the next image is a house, and that stands, let me see, in Gouda, Gouda, uh, at the Gouwe, between the Groenendaal and the Turf Market. This is not a house where he lived in, but where his grandson of the same name uh, lived in. And also Jan de Haan, who was a very trusted captain of Michiel de Ruiter. So when you're in Gouda at some time, check out this house. It has to do with the Vlak family. That's it uh, as far as it goes for Vlak. And that sort of finalizes the story. I'll go to the objects. Uh, I've enlarged the view here. All this time in this uh, glass stolp, I had a figurine. And that is this. Let me see. Uh, this is Michiel de Ruiter, as you can clearly see. You may recognize the style. Uh, it's by uh, Georges Rémy, who created Tintin, the film Tintin by Steven Spielberg, who was made after uh, Georges Rémy's character. And Georges Rémy also made a book about ships throughout the ages. Uh, there are a couple of Dutch ships in there. And there was one of the Z Seven Provinces, and this guy that's next to it, to me, clearly 
looks like Michiel de Ruiter only with brown hair. So I changed the brown hair to black hair and created a figurine. This, this is the only one. Moulin Sar does not create these. Moulin Sar is the company that creates Tintin stuff or approves Tintin stuff. Uh, this is a sculpture I made and it's on my, uh, what do you call it, counter there. That's number one. Now object number two. Uh, that has to do with uh, this image. <clears throat> I showed you a couple of bowl paintings. They were painted in uh, 1667 to 69. And they are the most well-known uh, paintings of the man. They're a little bit off probably and made a little more smoother than he actually was. We know that because of uh, earlier paintings. There's one painting that I find very, very cool that uh, no longer exists. It hasn't existed for centuries. That was painted by Jan Lievens, who was a colleague of Rembrandt. Uh, a painting of the son of the writer painted by Jan Lievens still exists, and it's in the Mauritshuis in The Hague. It's a museum. Uh, the painting of the writer himself no longer exists. I think it was sent to Denmark and got wrecked between the Netherlands and Denmark, but hey, that's just guessing. But I wanted to uh, recreate that painting. There are uh, two images of it. One is an etch by Bloteling, and the other is uh, a charcoal drawing by the Jonge. And the cool thing about the Jonge is, because we know when he passed away, we know that the painting must have been painted in 1664 or right before that. So that painting was earlier than the Ferdinand Boll paintings. Uh, based on those black and white drawings, I made a painting myself in oil. Which is this one, which indeed is the print on the door. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool to have this on the wall, right? And now uh, for the final image or the final object is a, is a project I'm still working on. I told you a little bit about the, the, <coughs> the wreck of the Walcheren that we've been looking for with the Royal Navy. This is uh, the stern. We have the lanterns, the symbol of Zeeland, the province Zeeland. The ship on the little image I just show you was the Seven Provinces, which was the flagship of Holland, province Holland. This was the flagship of the province Zeeland, where the writer was born. Two lions, uh, Batavire, Lions, and I still have to finish these. But once this is done, it's going to be on my walls as well, and it will be lit. Which I think is kind of cool. Eh? Like the ship models, only then as a lamp on the wall. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, and I'll be available after um, for questioning, for questions. <laughs> I gotta watch my language. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thank you so much, Arthur, for that um, presentation, for that talk. You're um, it was very interesting. Um, and now we have a question and um, our question and answer segment. Um, to begin may, may with. I, uh, may sure. I mention a, a short thing? Uh, sure. In the video, I talked about resolutions of the States General. And this morning, I found those. So I will be sending those your way. I found mention of one of the ships in the uh, recordings of the Admiralty of Amsterdam. And I have both the uh, instructions to build a Zeeland ship uh, of 163 feet in detail and a instruction for uh, an Amsterdam ship of 140 feet, which is rather close to the Huis de Kruiningen. That's new and I'll make sure that gets to you. Thank you so much. All this information is um, is much appreciated for sure. Okay, so we will begin. Um, we're very happy to have um, Dr. Kroon Bachwa, Professor Bachwa, Bachwa with us this morning, and I think he has a comment. So I'd ask him to to you know relay that comment to you live, Arthur. Please. Okay. But, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Skyler, thank you so much for uh, 
most informative and excellent lecture. They were, as I uh, texted you, there were details that I was not aware, among many other things. I did not know the coat of arms of uh, Rumer Flack. So now at least we know what we are looking for to offer the final proof of the identity of the ship. Uh, in fact, this is exactly the comment I wanted to make. Uh, we can prove that the wreck TRP-5 cannot be any of the other ships in Banks' squadron. I cannot prove that it is actually HT, uh, has the crime on hand. The only thing I can prove is that it cannot be any of the others. And I have published my thoughts behind the process. I will briefly repeat them here again. It is really the size of the wreck and the size of the cannon that are on the bottom. There are only three ships in Banks' squadron that could have carried 18 pounders or heavier artillery. The rest were smaller uh, warships, frigates essentially. And of the three, one was Beschermer or Beschermer. I have seen both and I'm probably mispronouncing it. No, that was good. the flagship. I'm sorry? It's good, Beschermer. Beschermer. Yeah. And that ship never sank. She was run aground, but she was refloated and repaired by the Dutch and captured only after the second battle. And subsequently, the French managed to wreck it on the Alice uh, reef. Therefore, it, tier B5 cannot be the Schermer. The other one was uh, armed the Zeeland. We don't know much about her. I have not been able to find her in any official list of uh, Dutch warships of the period, so she may have been privately owned man of war, but she did not sink either. She was run aground, damaged, but she did not sink. Therefore, the only one ship that was big enough to carry, that we know for a fact was armed with 18 and possibly 24 pounders. And it was the only ship that was actually wrecked and lost during the battle. That is how's the crying uh, hen. And uh, that is my logic behind identifying TRB-5 with uh, Kranenhen. It but sounds possible. <laughs> it is possible, but it is not positive scientific final evidence. Theoretically, it could be that one of the smaller ships carried heavier artillery. Mm -hmm. But the location is right, the size is right, the guns are right for Kranenhen and not for any of the other ships. Yeah, if, if it had been... Uh, sorry, if it had been a, a ship from Zeeland, uh, you could actually check the cannon with the registry because they have all cannons on all ships recorded throughout the centuries. But that does not exist for Amsterdam, unfortunately. Another challenge there would be that the cannon are all part of the coral. They have overgrown. They are completely encased in uh, concretion. So in order to see what is written on the breech of the gun and determine with certainty the exact caliber of the gun, the cannon need to be raised, they need to be conserved. And this is a lengthy and very yeah. expensive project. And after that, this is another, something that has to be maintained for perpetuity. The conservation never ends. It is an ongoing project uh, when such large iron objects are concerned like cannon. So at the moment, th this was, of course, this was the first thing that I would have liked to do, but breaking up the incrustation of the gun simply to determine what uh, inscription is on it would have restarted the process of deterioration. That would have been irresponsible, professionally yeah. speaking. That would have destroyed the cannon. So of course I couldn't do it. And until we have an operational conservation laboratory or a plan what how to conserve the material, uh, this cannot be done. Thank you. Thank you very much for the most interesting lecture again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Bachvara, for that um, comment. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, could you expand on the relationship between the Reuter and the Lampsons brothers? Um, you mentioned that in your, in your lecture, but that, that yes. might be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, in the 17th century biography, uh, uh, there's a little bit written about how he worked for the Lamsons uh, brothers. Uh, some people 
conclude from that that when he started as a little boy in the place where they made ropes that he worked for them but at that time when he was i think 10 he worked for their father i think one of them i, th I thought that was cornelis was uh, the same age as the writer and the other brother who lived in um, middelburg uh, on dam square uh, was 10 years older and they were uh, very familiar with each other because uh, later on when de Ruiter uh, went into his second career in Amsterdam, um, his daughter married someone from the Lomsens family. So they're actually officially uh, family also. Some people have suggested that perhaps uh, earlier because of how they look, uh, they are family, but that's certainly not true. They, they're just indirectly through family ties. And he's, uh, I think that he sailed on ships uh, that they owned uh, throughout his career in uh, Zeeland. And the ship Salamander that I showed you a drawing of with the old blue in the back, uh, I think was partly owned by Cornelis Lamsens. And but we don't, uh, okay, I, go ahead. I, uh, uh, this last year, uh, I was in contact with somebody who found records of the Lamsens family and he has not let me show, uh, uh, he hasn't shown them to me yet, but maybe this year I will get a view as to w what is in that. And of course, hopefully if those records are mentioned to be going any meaningful way, maybe you can share that information with us. That'd be very in yes, interesting to look at. Um, so on that, we don't see the writer on to be at all. He he did not. You don't have any information on of him visiting the island because I think you mentioned that in your in your lecture that he yes, did not. I've I've not. Uh, uh, as you know, I had a little trouble getting this uh, video uh, into one piece over to you, uh, mm -hmm. and I haven't been able to uh, check that specifically. But I will see uh, at one. I I think he has been to Tobago. He's sort of been to all the Caribbean islands. But I'll see if I can find the. I have all journals photographed over here, so I'll go through them and see if Tobago is in there. And if I have an image where it says Tobago and they're in his handwriting, that will be cool. I'll make it uh, out to you. I'll Most appreciated. Thank you so much. Okay, so another question um, about where the ship was built, um, the Hughes de Kernigan. Um, did you mention where it was built exactly? Because um, I think we've had some information that it was built in the port city of Vlissingen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. As to yeah, Vlissingen is uh, Flushing. Mm -hmm. That's where the router was born. That's Zeeland. But the ship was uh, built in Amsterdam. Okay. Because the uh, at first I thought Samuel Sautain was the one who built it, but he was a merchant, an influential merchant who had the ships built for the Republic of Genoa. Mm -hmm. And the, those resolutions from the States General are the first moment where the Admiralty obtains them. Uh, I, I, it's difficult to find out where Sautain had them built exactly, which ship, uh, shipyard that was. But they are certainly Amsterdam, and Amsterdam ships are built differently than Rotterdam ships and differently than uh, Zeeland ships. Interesting. Um, we actually have, have the name of the man who specifically built the ship. Okay. That is also known, the master ship, right? And yes, you correct it. It was in Amsterdam. Yes. There are Amsterdam ships. Okay. While we have you here, Professor Bashrov and Arthur, of course, if you have this answer, um, I myself am particularly interested in um, if there were any attempts to salvage from the this wreckage or or the all the wreckages of the Battle of Scarborough. Um, salvage the, the canon and so forth in that time period and if if maybe have you seen any evidence of that in in the archaeological excavations that you did let me uh say from archaeological point of view we have seen no evidence for the actual process of salvaging the canon but we do know that after the battle uh, banks jacob banks salvaged cannon to reinforce the fortification that he was uh, building which at the time of the battle was not yet completed he finished it subsequently 
as he had lost so much, uh, so many of his vessels, he needed to strengthen that even further. So cannon were salvaged from the wrecks. There is no specific, as far as I know, there is no specific mention from which wrecks. But that would certainly explain why we are finding fairly few uh, cannon. The rem remains are probably deeper into the bottom and we had not excavated to reach them. But I strongly suspect that significant numbers were dragged ashore. Uh, TRB-5, the presumed crown and hen, is close enough to shore that this could have been done. It is shallow enough that within 17th century technological means, this certainly could have been done by the Dutch. And we know for a fact that cannon were raised back then. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um... Because I was very interested in to know to know how would this be possible in deeper water with the available technology at the time. So that's there's uh, one uh, uh, example of a, sh a ship's bell, a diver's bell, in the muse Vasa Museum in Stockholm. It, it looks like the, the bell in a, ch a church bell, and there was mm -hmm. a person standing underneath who could breathe. That whole thing was lowered into the water. They could get out. Uh, from under there, f f look around, do things for two, three minutes, and get back into the ship's bell and breathe again. And they already understood back then that uh, about 15 to 20 minutes that would work, and then the bell would have to go up to get fresh air in again. There were a number of ways that could be done. Uh, the bell was used in deeper water. In Tobago, that would not have been practical. I suspect that they sent divers to tie the cannon and uh, drag them ashore with block and tackle. Uh, pretty much the same way that we use blocks and tackles on main sheets for modern sailboats, for cranes, that sort of uh, thing. Also, some of the Dutch vessels, the smaller vessels did survive, were uh, still afloat. They could have been used as lifting platforms also. There are a number of ways that uh, contemporary technology could have been done. In salvaging deep, water stuff in the 17th century Caribbean, the Spaniards were the grandmasters, mostly using Carib divers who could, who were vastly superior physically to European divers in the sense that they could hold their breath longer and could dive deeper. Uh, Mr. Skyde is quite uh, right uh, discussing the Vasa, as you probably remember, Ashley, I have, I worked two years on the Vasa years ago. Anyway, the point is that yes, with in deeper water, you can do this with a dive bell. In later periods, they even figured out how to refresh the air within the dive bell so that they can extend uh, the time. The limitations were the freshness of the air, the depth, and of course, the te water temperature. In the Caribbean, that's not really an issue. You're not likely to dive in hypothermia unless you're extremely stupid. Most of these people were not. Uh, so there are many ways in Tobago specifically. I suspect that it was simple block and tackle and uh, three divers going down to the cannon. As I said, the depth there is only about what, four, four and a half meters, something like this. Oh, thank you so much. We have um, Mr. Kevin Kenny, who's very interested in um, ships and shipbuilding in the comments as well. And he said, he placed a comment there. He said the wrecks were very in very shallow water. So the cannon could have easily been re re recovered. Also, some of the wrecks were not of the wrecks not yet found, maybe under the road, under the dock, much closer to shore. And that's, that's interesting as well. Um, mm -hmm. For sure, okay. I quite agree with Mr. Uh, Kenny. Okay. The majority uh, of the wrecks, as I said before, are actually under the modern Port Authority and mm -hmm. also under the modern coastal road that connects uh, the port with the main road system of the island. Okay. And Mr. Skyri, um, we're interested in perhaps getting models of these ships. Could you um, help us in that? respect the ships that were lost in this battle at Scarborough. If um, some of the models exist, maybe we can get replicas of them. Um, I don't know if that's possible. 
Now the 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 ship of the Huis Tijdverdrijf that I showed you, I think, is the in, in the Dutch Scheepvaart Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, Abhoving would be someone uh, best to approach. Uh, he's retired now, but uh, he has the connections to obtain such uh, uh, models of of, of ships. Uh, I could possibly make an impression of the, the TAF rail once I get that quality uh, image uh, delivered. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Okay, we have Professor Boomer in the comments as well, and he says the best documentary source on Tobago in the time of the Lampsons brothers is a book by Charles de Rochefort on Tobago, published in 1665. Right? So um, for more information on the Lampson's brothers, maybe we could, we could look at that source of information. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. I see a comment from um, Ms. Dr. Eric Odegaard who, who um, graced us a couple of weeks ago last year for, for a lecture. He says that, yes, Sao Jin is a merchant, and a broker and did not own a shipyard. I'm guessing, I'm guessing, but this is a hypothesis that it's actually the larger or the larger Bicca shipyard on Bicca Island. That's where the Gnome's painting is said to be situated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's indeed true. The, the, the painting was near that shipyard, but the, mm -hmm. the Bicca family bought the ship from Sautain who had them built. So uh, I think they were not built at the bigger shipyard, but at a shipyard that Sautain used. And Sautain was well known for his marble trade. A lot of buildings in the Netherlands have marble that came from uh, his, his, yeah, how do you call it? He delivered them from Italy. Okay. And I think Eric, Eric would like to make a comment. Eric, could you put on your, yeah. We, we can't hear you. Does it, do you hear me now? Yes, I yes. can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, actually, well, I don't think the Bickers buy the ships in their private capacity, but one of the Bicker brothers, and I always mix up my Bickers, but hey, there's four of them, um, serves as uh, one of the Lords of the Admiralty in Amsterdam at the time. He's also an East India Company director, and another one is a West India Company director, but they don't buy it as a, in a private capacity, they buy the ships in the capacity as the Admiralty of Amsterdam. Yes, uh, Samuel Sautain himself was ontvanger generaal, the main administrator from 1644 on. So they were probably both in those positions of buying and building ships uh, for the Admiralty yeah. for the cause of war. Yes, yeah. but, but so it wouldn't, it, it's not unheard of. In fact, it's, it's quite common practice in, in the Dutch Republic that um, in one capacity, say, Lord of the Admiralty, you buy a ship from a shipbuilder who just happens to be um, yourself. Uh, so uh, we, we would frown upon it, but it's quite common then. And we do know that the Bickers own one of the largest privately owned shipyards in Amsterdam, which is capable of building, because these are, for the time, these are very large ships. Um, that's true. So the Admiralty Yard would be able to build this. The East India Company Yard certainly would be able to build this. But there aren't that many private yards that are equipped to build warships this big. And the Biggers have one. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an inference. I'm hoping that the notarial archives in Amsterdam will, will bring more of this to light. That could be a source, yes. Yeah. So, but uh, it, it, it's entirely possible. Because that, that painting that you referred to in the National Gallery in, in Washington, uh, D.C., is said to be situated in the dock in front of the Bicker Yard. Yes. Which is, the I think, this Wieten fitting out. Um, so that would be, uh, that's my working hypothesis so far. Anyway, back to, uh, I'll lower my hand and I will, I will shut up. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you so much, Eric, for that contribution. Um, okay, we have one question here from Dr. Pemberton. To what extent was there general public knowledge 
any support for the Dutch colonizing enterprise. Public knowledge or support, I guess, for the Dutch colonizing enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the question is is how how uh, how were was the general public aware of these colonizing uh, mm -hmm. efforts? Yeah, uh, I believe so. The 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 brothers Lamsins uh, uh, made an agreement with the States General to become patrons of several islands in the Caribbean. So people uh, in administrative functions would have known that they did that but if you live in the netherlands and you only hear the stories of people coming into the ports and go into the pubs you get a sort of a distorted story so uh, what they knew then compared to what the general public knows now i think is vastly different i think they did not know the details of what what happened at that time. Okay. I we have thank you so much for that. Um, we have another comment from Mr. Kenny. He said he's been looking for plans to build a model of any of the ships, be them French or Dutch, but so far I have not found any good enough to be historically accurate models. I've been in touch with Abe Oven and he confirmed this, and I will be happy to build the model if I'm able to find the plans. Yes, and I know um, from personal experience, Mr. Kenny is a fantastic uh, model builder. So hopefully he gets that information and we can well, have models of these ships. What, what, what they did not have, what they have today is uh, the precise uh, building drawings. They didn't work that way. They usually worked with bestek, which is a description in words as to exactly how long certain elements are and where they are compared to the others under which angles. So uh, something like this, which is a 140 foot uh, ship built in Amsterdam would be the most accurate indication of what it looked like. But then still, there's a certain level of interpretation. That's why they use those models to say oh, it needs to be sort of like this and less like that one. You know, there's also known the, the portraits where you see a, a ship in one painting from the side, from the front uh, and from the back. And I, uh, I see a comment here. I, I will make sure that this description makes its way over to you after I uh, translated most of what I can understand of what the word is. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you can also um, put your email address in the chat. So if there's any questions, maybe Mr. Kenny would like to talk to you one-to-one. Um, -one. I will. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, I think that we could um, bring this first um, lecture of 2022 to an end. I hope everybody, um, you know, as I did, got so much information from, from this lecture. And I hope that you'll be with us um, next week uh, for next week's lecture. And I know that um, Dr. Guy will tell you more about that. So um, on to you, Dr. Guy. Hi everyone, good morning again. I want to thank um, Arthur for his presentation. You're welcome. And um, this is the reason why I was very happy to be involved in this project. Because from this project, we started with um, Professor Bachvarov giving us an overview of the whole battle in 1677. And then we went on to Professor Nailing who did um, dendrochronology, and Professor Pemberton, who gave us the um, information on Tobago, and Professor Beaumont, and so many other participants, so the lecturers, and people who were directly involved in this whole Dutch relations in Tobago. I do hope that we have um, the administration, the new administration in Tobago listening, that they can see how valuable this project is to the island as part of its history, its culture, and also tourism. We have a new aspect of it, antiquity. So I'm hoping that this would um, be something that they would be interested in. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Kevin Kenny for his work and the promotion and production of the movie Tobago 1677. 
that has actually helped a lot to advertise and inform this project. I was trying to get the Tobago House of Assembly to ensure that every student in Tobago sees this movie. And um, you know, I, I continue to ask and knock on doors to make sure that this project is part of the, um, the history of Tobago. So again, I want to say that next week, we will have um, another researcher, Jan de Vries, and he would be doing Jacob Benkus, his adventurous life and strange and surprising legacy. So that would be his um, contribution to this lecture series. And then the following week, we have Gert Struh, Professor Gert Struh, Tobago as a patronship from Zealand. And the final part of this lecture series would be a round table where all the professors, Professor Beaumont, Professor Pemberton, and all the other professors, we have um, Professor Madia Farag Miller, she will also be make a contribution, the Dutch Ministry of Culture, the city of Vlissinger, the Museum of Vlissinger, they would all come together for a final um, presentation. And if there are questions, you will be able to ask. Again, I say thank you to Arta, and um, we are grateful. I am grateful for all the professors who participated because I asked and you answered my call. Again, I say thank you and see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lievis, for all the effort that you have put into this. <laughs> Truly appreciate it.